Hi, good morning. Welcome, everyone. So excited to see you and this lovely fall day. We certainly have better weather this fall than we did last spring. Mm -hmm. We had rain, I think, every mm -hmm. single time we gave a lecture. Um, I'm really super excited to introduce Neil Murray today. He is going to be giving us a wonderful lecture on art. And we're sort of in a series. Um, and in the spring, we did Greek and Roman and Byzantine, and now we're moving into medieval today um, and going forward. Um, you all probably know him. He's one of our gold finchers, um, and he does have some sculpture up in the uh, creative arts area right now, if you'd like to come up and see that. He's an artist as well as a professor and historian, um, and as well as a lot of other gold finchers. So um, come on up and see the art show. Um, and I will just turn him over and let him go with all everything else. And I'm so excited that he's got some voice this fall that he can lend to us. So thank you. Thank you, Jana. Can you all hear me? I, you know, I'm glad to say that I have enough of a voice that at least there's a possibility of hearing me. Um, again, thank you all for coming. And I'd like to start off with thanks because a series like this can't be done just by me. Needless to say, Jana has been extremely helpful. She helps me find these images on the internet. She arranges for the room. She gets everything set up, so uh, I, I certainly am grateful to her. I'm also grateful for people who are not in this room. There are some senior doctors down at Christ Hospital that gave me my voice back. And uh, so I, needless to say, I'm deeply grateful for them. And uh, I'm also grateful for Marilyn. She has typed out these sheets that are outlines, but even more importantly, she was the one that took me down to uh, Montgomery Road, uh, downtown to Christ Hospital, almost every day from May through August. Some days we had to go both places. So um, she put a huge amount of effort to get me ready to, uh, to try to talk about medieval art today. I'm going to give you a little aside. As we were looking at these images, uh, Jana admitted that this period that we're talking about was totally missing from her art education. Now that's not surprising. This is a period that often gets omitted from art education because it's a very, very difficult period to talk about. Uh, try, one of the things when you're teaching art history, you try to help people understand the historical context in which that art is shaped because art grows out of a human community. And if you don't understand the community, you have a heck of a time understanding the art. It works both ways. The art helps you understand the community. The community helps you understand the art. Well, this is a time of dissolution of the European community, and therefore it's hard to make sense out of it. And so it often gets neglected. One of the first things I said to Jana is when we started to put this material together, I said, I don't want a dark color in the background there. I want a bright color, because this is usually called the Dark Ages, and that's profoundly misleading. Uh, it's a period that got named that because 
Art historians, the whole subject of art history, didn't really start until the Renaissance. They were judging this art by Greek and Roman standards and, of course, Renaissance standards, and they regarded it as just a kind of uh, burp in European society without much of a coherence to it. And uh, so it got labeled Dark Ages. Modern art historians who have been enlightened by the subject of modernism all of a sudden have learned to appreciate the art of the period we're talking about. But it requires a kind of modern sensibility, strangely enough, to really come to terms with it and appreciate it because it's fundamentally abstract and a spiritualized kind of art form. Ironically, even though it may not have Christian foundations, uh, modernism in the visual arts starts from the same kind of spiritual uh, starting points. So there is a strange uh, kind of resonance between modern art and the art you're going to be seeing today. Do whatever you can to not judge it by Renaissance and uh, realist type standards because it's a very, very sophisticated art form that uh, deserves a much deeper respect than it normally gets. We're going to start with uh, an object that was uh, found in a ship burial. Okay, now the color is a little dim in, in, on this particular uh, image. Let me give you a little sense of background here. As I say, it's very complicated and I can't make coherent what's fundamentally incoherent. You had the Roman Empire which brought structure and order to almost all of Western Europe. You've got roads, you've got governance, you've got military uh, control. All of that starts to disappear around the year 500. And barbarian tribes that were generally outside of the empire, by the way, they get the name barbarian because they don't speak either Greek or Latin. And uh, they were generally in the north and they were outside the empire, but there are huge uh, different crowds of them and they're constantly moving around. So you've got the Lombards in northern Italy, you've got the Franks, you've got, needless to say, the Vikings who end up uh, predating on, uh, throughout the Middle Ages, you've got the Celts, uh, you've got the Franks. They're all moving around, changing territories. There is almost no explainable, simple coherence to this age other than the one enduring institution that carries through from the Roman Empire. And that's the Roman Church. The Church becomes the cohering institution and in fact, as I try to explain these various periods to you, I generally try to talk about what I think is the dominant art form. Each age has its own kind of art form as a dominance. And uh, today I'm going to talk about illuminated manuscripts because they seem to shape uh, that entire period and shape the art that comes after that period. Next week we're going to talk about Romanesque art and I'm going to show you some portals for Romanesque churches and they simply look like manuscripts carved out of stone. Um, anyway, this particular purse cover we see was found in a ship burial 
uh, Vikings tend to bury uh, ships with all these uh, prize goods on the ships with rulers and leaders and they create these burial mounds and uh, so often in these mounds we found beautiful objects that tended like the Egyptians try to include things from this life for the afterlife and this purse cover was found on the Sutton Ho burial mound it's in a technique called cloisonne. It's a very fascinating technique. Um, I'll give you a personal indication of my own life. I didn't find it fascinating at all when I first encountered it. I found it intimidating because my first college teaching job was at Wittenberg University and one of the courses I had to teach was copper enameling. I have never done copper enameling in my life before, and all of a sudden I'm teaching a college level course in copper enameling. That's what this is. This is copper enameling. Cloisonne is basically you start with a copper surface, then you solder gold fences onto that surface, creating a pattern. Inside of those fences, you either put gems or more likely powdered glass. Then the trick is to heat this thing up in such a way that the glass melts and fuses into a solid sheet, but if you heat it too much, of course the gold melts. So the trick is to get all that working together. But it creates a beautiful art form, brilliant in color as I say this slide, is somewhat dim, but it shows us some of the major features that we're going to see throughout the medieval period. The most obvious thing to talk about here is what is usually called the animal style. We've in the past in this class talked a little bit about the animal style, and we also talked about interlace. These are techniques that probably came from the east and migrated into Western Europe. And uh, they basically are more or less abstract patterns. You'll notice this figure matches this figure. And if you look carefully, it looks kind of abstract, but the medieval artist does not care about realism. They care about the visual emotional energy of the image and likeness is secondary. It only matters if it's got some level of recognizability. So here you see the human figure broken down into these linear outlines. Again, remember that's the nature of cloisonne. Uh, it has these gold fences. And then on either side of them, these animals, which no one has uh, quite fully defined, some people think of them as giant cats, lions, or something like that, they become some sort of metaphor for power. It's usually lions and big cats become symbolic that way. Anyway, you'll notice you've got the male figure, then these uh, cat-like animals, and that gets repeated over here. Now the middle section has a unique combination and if I don't tell you what it is, you'll have a hard time figuring out. There are two animals. Does anyone have any idea what you're seeing there? Anyone? It's not simple to decipher. There is a little bit of a clue, Frank. I think it's a penguin. It's what? A penguin. A penguin. Okay. Uh, Kelly. I, I think the smaller one is a horse and the top one might be an elephant. Okay, we got penguins, we got elephant, we got horses. Look, like dodo Look at that. That's supposedly a duck being attacked 
by an eagle. Yeah, if you're, if you're having a hard time seeing that, you know, welcome to the crowd, everyone, because they don't care that much about, about realism. But notice what you get is these vivid colors and high energy to the style. Cloisonne by its technique, by these gold fences, is a linear technique. The dominant visual element throughout the Middle Ages is line. Visual elements are things like color, shape, volume. Line is the most energetic, the most active of the visual elements and most able to communicate emotion. Because to make a line, we have to move. And when we move, we feel a certain way. So the connection between motion and emotion is really significant. And even though this art may look abstract, it is in fact filled with, filled with emotional energy. What they do, however, because there is so much energy in these forms, they come up with a way to control it. And that technique is symmetry. So you notice everything here is symmetrical, even though it's got all of this energy in these individual forms, it's all held in check by a larger symmetrical pattern. Okay, can we see the next one, please? This is a Viking uh, animal head from the Osberg ship burial. Again, a giant ship got buried. And it's curious, um, those of you interested in sexual roles would find it curious to discover that the dominant regal figures in the Osberg ship burial were not men. There were two Viking women who were apparently very hierarchical figures in that society. Anyway, this is the ship that was uh, buried with them. This is part of the ship. And this particular figure here is part of the prow. And again, you see what we're talking about. It's an animal shape. And again, it's a kind of mythical animal. Uh, but it's covered with interlace. This weaving linear quality. All of that is held in check by a kind of symmetry. But there's a tremendous amount of energy in the form. The mouth is open. Uh, you see these prominent teeth. And imagine if you're uh, a peaceful European and you see a ship like this pull up to your shore, you gotta be, you gotta run for your life. Um, by the way, the Vikings were mostly, not exclusively, but mostly Norwegians and Danes. Uh, and they ended up getting, becoming a part of almost all of Western Europe. A lot of people heard, heard the term Norman. In fact, next week, we're going to talk about the Norman invasion of England. The word Norman comes from the word North men. And they were Danes who settled in northern France and eventually, of course, conquered England. So you get these constant shiftings around in European culture. And the most militaristic of these people tend to be the Vikings. Can we, can we see the next one, please? This is a, a wooden panel from a stave church. Uh, that's uh, a stave church. First of all, a stave is a wooden vertical form that's tapered at the top. It's wide at the bottom, tapered at the top, and it becomes a structural element in, uh, ch in wooden churches. 
We know a little bit about these wooden churches because a few of them still exist today. There's very little architecture from the evil period we're talking about because most of the architecture, I'm only going to show you one or two examples today, was wooden. And of course, we know what Vikings do to wooden architecture. The only churches we, we find today that are wooden churches are in Scandinavia because they burned everyone else's churches down but their own. And so we actually have some existing stave churches in Scandinavia. They're strange buildings, though. They're not a church in the sense that we think of a church. I would call them more a chapel. They tend to be very vertical, but not very big at all, uh, with a, a very strong vertical emphasis. And you can get that sense from this particular panel. This is from the ten uh, hundreds, but in fact, it ended up getting put on a, uh, a church that's a hundred years uh, newer than it. It got saved, and it becomes a portal or entryway. And again, you see the style we're talking about. Look carefully, and all of these interweaves, all of this interlace starts to take on an animal-like character. Right here is probably the easiest one to read. It looks like some sort of a tall animal, a horse, or something like that. Uh, over here you see plant elements, but you notice the whole thing is twisting, turning, undulating, tremendous amount of visual energy in this thing and a huge complicated carving feat to carve uh, something like this. How tall is that? Uh, I assume it's, it's the, the slide didn't give a measurement, but I assume if it's a doorway, it's in, in normal human scale, six, seven foot high, you know. The uh, Norwegian's a little taller than the average European, so it's probably in the seven foot range or so. Thank you. And I assume it was brightly colored when it uh, was originally made. Now, can we see the next one, please? This is what we call a carpet page from one of the medieval gospels. This is from the Lindisfarne gospel. Lindisfarne is a uh, area in Ireland, and Ireland in some ways sort of led the uh, medieval age. It was a kind of strange thing because the church was the dominant institution there. The Irish converted rather quickly Remember, the Romans didn't go as far as Ireland. So the Irish eventually get converted, and, but they, because they're so far away from Rome, the church is still a dominant force in Rome. We're going to, in a little bit, we're going to get up to the year 800, and Charlemagne gets crowned at St. Peter's in Rome. So the Vatican is still a central force in Europe, even though Rome has, has been overrun and no longer functioning the way it did in ancient times. But the Irish uh, monasteries are so far away from Rome that they kind of do things their own way. They, they don't, they're not very much subject to the uh, Roman orders. The dominant order at this time would have been the Benedictines. And that's going to change when we get to the Renaissance. All of a sudden, we're going to get to the Franciscans, and that's going to change the whole Western world. But anyway, this is a carpet page from the Lotus of Arn, uh, Gospel. It's not particularly big. I think it's, I think in your outline, I give you the measurements. I think it's like, 13 by 10 or something like that. 
Now keep in mind, this is a completely illiterate world. The only place where there is learning is the church. There's no such thing as public education or anything like that. The only place Latin and Greek are still read and understood is in these monasteries. And of course, what's more important to monastery than the Bible? So the most sacred book that becomes part, becomes almost a centerpiece of a monastery is a particular Bible. Now keep in mind they regard this as a sacred holy book that's come down from heaven and so it deserves endless reverence and respect. The monasteries had what we call scriptoria. These were large open areas where the monks copied uh, all the available texts that came to them from the Roman Empire. A lot of the, uh, the things that we think today that we know from the past from Rome actually came to us through these monasteries. They were centers of learning. Now imagine the work that went into number one, just figuring out this page, figuring out this complex interlace, and then coloring it all. Um, it's by the way on vellum. Vellum is, is a kind of sheepskin that's been thin and processed. And manuscript illumination, I think I mentioned this a little bit to you last time, starts to develop in the late Roman world with the development of what we call a codex. That's a fancy word for what we call a book. Before that, things were scrolled, they were rolled. Well, when you have a scroll, you're rolling this thing. Painted images don't hold up well when they get constantly rolled like that. So manuscript illumination actually starts in the Roman world and it develops coincidentally with the whole idea of the codex. So often these codexes were then made with these animal skins. And by the way, they also developed the compass at this point. And you can see how the compass has been used throughout this particular image. Now, you can't see it as closely as I'd like you to be able to see it. But if you look really carefully, and I see if I can find something myself here that will help you, all of these things out here are mostly serpents, sort of tangled in each other. Even though they look like round patterns, they're undulating serpent dragon shapes, all in these outer areas. Remember, remember when I talked about the animal style in interlace, I said they always try to find a way to control it because it can just get out of control. Here the controlling instrument is the cross itself. And the cross, if you look carefully at the cross, there are no animals in the cross. All of a sudden the cross has subdued all of this wild energy uh, that's outside of the cross and becomes a center of order and structure in that chaotic, turbulent, medieval world. These little circles in the cross actually help center that form even more. And the irony of it is that the rigid structure of that cross almost makes the turbulence of these other forms more turbulent. So you get a contrast between that clear, sharp structure and that wild irregularity. Now keep in mind, this is a 
superstitious world. This is a pre litter world. And they think of spirits all over the place. That's, that's part of medievalism, even goes as late as Martin Luther. And when he was in the Wartburg uh, prison or palace, he threw an ink pot at the devil. That's, that's part of that kind of medieval spiritualism. And Luther is normally regarded as a guy who moves Europe away from that kind of spiritualism. So anyway, this is sometimes this complex busyness is sometimes, I think this, I've used this term with you before, we call it horror vacuate. It means a fear of empty spaces. Empty spaces can be filled. And if you don't occupy them with good things, bad things, can come in those empty spaces. So it's a typical pattern in most uh, cultures in early developmental phases to have very complex ornamentation that cover, covers almost every square inch as a, of a surface. That's a way of controlling the uh, spiritual forces. Imagine how long it would take to make something like this. Remember, this is just one page of a gospel. Just one page. And often, it was very rare for a, uh, a monastery to have a full Bible. One gospel was a big, big deal uh, because these things took forever to make. Now, can we see the next one, please? The Book of Kells is normally regarded as probably the highest development of this kind of animal style interweave ornamentation. This is a Cairo iota page. If I remember correctly, it's the opening page from the Gospel of Matthew. I can help you understand this style a little more with this image because I can identify things that I think you'll be able to see more clearly. First of all, notice the human head right there. Also notice up here a human head. Notice here, that's an uh, angel, look, almost looks to me like two angels, excuse me, and then another angel right there. Again, everything is stylized. It's all flattened out. It's all turned in, into outline. And of course, uh, there's gilding, gold leafing on the page. Again, this is regarded as a sacred text. You can't make it uh, too ornamental, too beautiful. Uh, it's got to be lavish. It's got to be really important. When you take that style and start to try, turn it into a narrative mode, can, see, can we see the next one, please? You start to come up with something like this, and the next image I'm going to show you. This is one of the uh, Irish high crosses. This is a cross of Mir uh, Miradot. And, uh, it's huge. It's 18 feet high. Now, I don't know what our height here is, probably 13, 14 uh, feet, maybe 15. So it's taller than, quite a bit taller than this room. And although it's a sculpture, look at the image itself. It's just a manuscript in stone. It's the same style that we see in the manuscripts. It's confined now again to the cross page. This is this side reveals the uh, the, uh, the resurrection of Christ, and I wanted you to see the back side, the 
the uh, right image is the image on the reverse of the center section of this cross. That's the crucified Christ. And this image in the middle here is the resurrected Christ. Beneath that image, you start to get a common theme that's going to show up in medieval and in uh, Romanesque art quite a bit. It's called the weighing of souls. Uh, I'm going to show you an image from um, Mossack uh, next time where you have these people, their souls are being weighed. This is the last judgment. And you've got a demon who's trying to press down on the scale because we think of weighing in terms of weight and the heavier your soul, the more likely you're going to go to hell. The whole idea is you're supposed to be spiritualized, etherealized. So the angel on the one side of the scale is sort of cupping this image, trying to lift it up, and the demon on the other side is, is yanking down to get the soul to go on to hell. Anyway, beneath this, uh, the resurrected Christ, the panels we start to see there are part of the weighing of souls concept. But you'll notice, although it's a giant, beautiful object, it's really dominated by the manuscript illumination tradition. It's done in this somewhat abstract style. Look at the figure of Christ in the uh, crucifixion panel. It looks kind of puppet-like. They don't, they don't seem to care very much about exact anatomy. Recognition is all they care about. That Beyond that, realism just isn't a value. If we try to judge them by our realistic values, we completely misunderstand what their intentions were. Can we see the next one, please? You can see how the energy of interlace and an animal style is filling this image. This is a title page from the Saint Matthew of Saint Matthew from the Ebel Gospels. Um, and this is obviously has some relation to Roman illumination, but it's completely reinterpreted in a, uh, a medieval manner. Look at the linearity. Remember what I said about line. It communicates motion and therefore emotion. And look at how linear this image is. Everything is active line. By the way, in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a winged figure. That's the symbol for the uh, Gospel of Matthew. And look at uh, Matthew's hair. It looks more like Medusa with serpents and so on in it. So the lines are so complex and active. And you can see how he's, his body is totally energized because he represents this idea of spiritual illumination. But just the sheer energy of these medieval images, how you can think of this as a dark age. I don't think this is dark at all. I think this is amazing kind of expressive uh, energy. And I've seen the uh, title pages from some of the other uh, gospels and they're, they're all as animated as this particular page is. Now, can we see the next one, please? As I mentioned to you, there's very little in the way of durable architecture uh, during this period. There was a guy you've probably heard of. His name was Charlemagne. 
he ended up getting crowned uh, by the Pope in uh, around the year 800 and end up coalescing a lot of the tribes, mostly in Germany, an area slightly beyond Germany, and establishing what was called the Holy Roman Empire. Rick Steves makes a comment in one of his commentaries about this. It wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. But anyway, it's the closest thing to order you get in that world. Now, Charlemagne traveled quite a bit. He had traveled, of course, he was uh, uh, crowned in Rome, but he had traveled to Ravenna. I don't know if you remember from last time we looked at Byzantine architecture, and I showed you a church called San Vitale that the whole interior of the church was uh, bright mosaics. Uh, across from the altar you had Theodora on one side holding the uh, chalice of wine and then uh, Justinian, who was one of the very last of the Roman emperors, on the other side holding the, uh, the bread. Anyway, it was a circular plan church, as most of the Eastern churches were. Charlemagne was impressed with it, and so his palace chapel is sort of modeled on it. And if you look at the dome, you see that's all mosaics up there. And uh, if you look at the lower level, you can see the ceilings that are uh, sort of caught by the arch shapes coming down are also mosaics. It's basically modeled on a Byzantine form, but it's, it's much clearer, it's much stronger, it's much more uniform floor plan than any Byzantine church would be. And to start to help us understand that in the West, Physical forms start to take on more importance. In Byzantine world, the spiritual realm continues on. Remember, the Byzantine Empire went as far as the Renaissance. Didn't fall until 1454. Well, but in the West, the physical starts to take more important form. And you can see how the, the arch forms become powerful, simple, geometric, clear forms. This, this building is pretty easy to figure out. The one part of it that makes no sense at all, and of course what he was doing is modeling this partly on San Vitale, but also at other Roman uh, buildings that were left in ruins. Look up here. This makes no sense at all. The Romans played a little bit with the uh, Greek orders. They, the Greeks were very, very rigid about the way they used their orders. The Romans started to mess with that. But none, they didn't mess this much. You don't, one of the rules is a column must rest on a flat surface. Its whole purpose is to support. These columns have no supporting function whatsoever. You notice the real support is down here. Next time, I'm going to be explaining structural engineering because I have to help you understand what's distinctive about Romanesque churches. You don't need columns down here. These arches have plenty of strength to support up this. The only reason those columns are there, if you look at them, you can get a little sense of the color. You don't get a, a, a really clear sense here. They're, they're done in a purplish marble. And it's a very precious stone. And it's simply his way of showing off his, uh, his importance and his wealth. But uh, the rest, but a complete in contradiction to the, the clear structural character of the rest of this building. 
this is the closest thing you're going to see f to permanent architecture this early on. Now can we see the next one, please? Notice the dates here. This is St. Michael's Church. Now if you look at it, it may look very modern to you. Well, the reason it looks modern is it's been rebuilt. It was uh, bombed during World War II and reconstructed. But it was reconstructed faithfully. Normally, when we reconstruct things, there's this tendency to modernize them. And in this particular church, they, they had a, a very strong historical sense, and they tried to keep it pretty much in its uh, character. It's obviously, uh, it, it's, it's in Germany, and it represents a pattern that becomes part of German churches. It ha I think I, in the past I've explained to you what a transept is. A transept, you, with a church plan, the typical Christian church faces to the east, the altar faces to the east, the symbol is the rising sun. The altar was originally sarcophagus, and the emphasis is on resurrection. The sun becomes a metaphor for resurrection. The west end of the church is the entry of the church. And the whole idea is you get this long tunnel view of that dramatic altar area. Now, as the church developed, they also came up with the idea of a choir. And so they came up with the idea of a cross arm. That's what a transept is. So the floor plan of most Christian churches is a cross-shaped floor plan. And the uh, German churches, for some reason or other, emphasize the West work, that the West is the entry of the church, as much as they emphasize the East, the, the East work. And so the West work becomes mostly a narthex, uh, which is a kind of place for people to meet before they go into the, the sanctuary. Depending on the domination you're part of, the domination Marilyn and I were a part of for many years, the narthex was almost as big as a sanctuary because of extremely social denomination. Some of the most important things happened in the church narthex, not in the sanctuary. But so the German churches have these very drama, dominant west works, but you'll notice they also have towers. Those towers typically are bell towers. Anyway, this is the reconstructed St. Michael's Church. Now I want to show you something that was part of that church that was not damaged uh, during the war. Can we see the next one, please? These are the Westwork entry doors to St. Michael's. Now look at the measurement at the bottom. The door itself is 16 feet 6 inches high. Again, that's a huge door. Imagine the weight of metal like that. And what's most amazing about it, it was all cast in one piece. Normally bronze casting Although you might see this big object, normally it's cast in sections, and then they get welded together. One of the reasons you don't cast big objects uh, intact is the metal freezes. It takes a huge amount of fuel. Remember, you've got to keep things around 2,000 degrees, which is the flowing temperature for most bronze casting. You've got to keep this whole mold at 2,000. Now, 2,000 degrees is white heat, folks. You've got to keep that whole mold that hot for long. And then imagine the tons of bronze 
poured into that mold, keeping it hot enough so it didn't freeze. Sometimes you, if, if your mold is not quite hot enough, the metal freezes halfway down. You don't know that happened until you, you knock the investment off of it, which is your casting shapes, and then you melt the metal and start all over again. The metal cannot be allowed to freeze. Anyway, I want to show you a panel here that you can see again how, uh, although this is, we would call it sculpture, it's shaped by the manuscript illumination tradition. It's a wonderful, charming panel. This is a story of God, if you look to the right, story of God talking to Adam of an Eve, and notice his accusing finger is aiming at Adam. And notice how primitive Adam's body and Eve's body are. And now they're trying to hold their fig leaves over their privates. So Adam then points backwards underneath his arm towards Eve. I didn't do it, she did it. Now Eve is covering her genital area, but what is she doing? She's pointing down, and what's down there? A serpent. So God points, Adam says it wasn't me, points back to Eve, Eve says it wasn't me, she points down to the serpent. It's just a wonderful, charming understanding of that kind of biblical story. And look at, even though it's sculpture, look at the uh, interlace on the far left side of it and the uh, sort of interlaced trees on the, uh, on the right side of the image. Now notice we're right at the back edge of the medieval period. Now we're talking about architecture now we're talking about important technical feats enable you to make this, these kind of grand churches. And that's going to prepare us for next week when we start to look at uh, Romanesque churches that will be made in stone, no longer in wood. Now I want to give, I always try to give a couple of minutes for questions. So can I help anyone with any questions here? We got another four or five minutes if one more slide. Yeah. One more slide. Don't we have one more? Oh yeah. This is a Garrow crucifix. I showed you one crucifix at the very end of the Byzantine era, the so-called Daphne crucifix, it was done in mosaic. And it was a life-size image of the crucified Christ. So that image and it, its dating was fairly similar to the Garrow crucifix. The crucifix was not an early Christian form of art. It was an embarrassment to the church. It was a form of uh, death for criminals. And so the crucifix becomes a very, very late addition to Christian, the Christian symbolic vocabulary. And I think it's interesting that it becomes a dominant symbol in the West, especially in the Roman church. Just about every Roman church you go into, you'll see a crucifix in the center section of the, uh, the apse of the church. It's interesting that it happens in the West. Now remember, sculpture is an art form that the church has very bad feelings about because the first persecutions happened because of the sculpture. If you were a Roman citizen, 
What you had to do, just like Americans pay allegiance to the flag, if you were a Roman citizen, there would be a statue of the emperor in town, and you would be asked to pay homage to that statue and basically say, Caesar is Lord. The early Christians refused to do that. In fact, the first confession shows up in the New Testament. I happen to think it's still the best confession is Jesus is Lord. And remember the Roman emperor is not only a civic figure, he's also a religious figure. He's, he's regarded as descended from the gods. Well, the Christians refused to do that. And that, that became their marker. That's how people knew that they were Christian. So they had a terrible feeling about sculpture. It just became a source of nothing but trouble for the church. Now that memory is a thousand years old practically, or eight, nine hundred years old. And all of a sudden, the passion of the Christ starts to become a major motif. And the Garrel Crucifix, again, although it represents the lack of understanding of anatomical structure, if you try to look at the deltoid area, that's the upper capping uh, muscle on the upper shoulder, pectoralis major in the chest area. This figure doesn't make a lot of sense anatomically, but it has a powerful, powerful energy to it. And you can see the power of sculpture. All of a sudden, it engages you because it's now a spatial art form. It's in the same space you're in. It can engage you in ways that these linear arabesques never could. It's interesting, the back of the head of the Christ is hollowed out in the Garrow crucifix, and it actually held, holds the, uh, the host for communion. Anyway, look at the scale of it. It's life scale. And this is the first of these things to appear in the West. But again, I want to emphasize that. It's in the West that this sort of thing appears. The West tends to take the faith and actualize it, make it physical. Well, that's going to get climax in some of the uh, Renaissance theology I'm going to talking to be talking to you about that grows out of the Franciscan movement. Okay, now can I help you with any questions? Yeah. Two quick questions. Is that made of wood? Yes, it's wood. Okay. And yeah. is that it's, it's gold leafed. Yeah, wood that's been gold leafed. Yeah. And, and is that a, a saying way above there? Is, is it what? Um, way above on, on the uh, Oh yeah, the the, the symbol? Yeah. yeah. This is the inscription for the uh, Christ, King of the Jews that was part of one of the gospel narratives uh, Pilate put on top of the cross. Typically in the Roman church, you'll see, those are the initial letters of the words uh, that rather than the entire in inscription. And notice again, uh, the figure is haloed and uh, that'll become a pretty consistent part of the uh, Western tradition uh, representing the figure. Can I help anyone with questions? Yes, Marge. Uh, what did they use for pigment on wood and on the vellum? I'm sorry, what? What did they use for pigment when they colored the wood? And what did they use for pigment on the Oh, tempera. Do you, now, do you know what tempera is, Marge? I know what it is. It is like a Michael's device. 
Well, the modern version of tempera is poster paint. It's a water-based paint, but in fact, it's pigment that's mixed with egg yolk. And those of you who've left eggs on dishes know that all of a sudden it can become a pretty good glue. So egg yolk becomes the binder. Pigment with, with all paints, you have the pigment itself, which is typically a dry powder, usually a mineral powder, like for instance, if it's going to be blue, it's cobalt oxide. But then you also have what we call a binder. That helps to glue the pigment down to the support, which is the surface you're painting on. In this case, the support, in the case of manuscripts, the support was vellum, and the egg yolk mixed with the pigment become the tempera paint that glues itself down to that, that surface. And of course, gold leafing, the leafing can get attached to that surface, actually glued onto the surface. Does that answer your question? Yes. Modern poster paint is simply a very cheap version of this. I have a good friend who is a very gifted realist painter, and he paints in egg tempera. Most of his painting is done in egg tempera. In fact, Kelly, I think, has a portrait of me that he had painted done in egg tempera. And it can be a very realistic media. It was a dominant medium before oil paint came along. Tempera and fresco were the dominant mediums. And when we get to the Renaissance, I'll explain much more about what fresco is and how it's done. But anyway, that's, that's the medium they work with. So it's a water-based medium, which means you better move along in what you're doing, because this thing is drying while you're doing it. Any other questions I can help you with? Well, it's about lunchtime, folks. Thank you again for coming. <clears throat>